This is Professor Gavor, and this is Chapter 1 of the Principles of Microeconomics books by OpenStax. It's our free textbook that we're using in this class. In this first chapter, we're going to talk about what is economics, why is it important, and uh, the difference between micro and macro, and macro, of course, was a prerequisite for this class. We want to know about how economics use theories and models to understand economic issues. And we want to organize, uh, see how economies are organized and provide an uh, overview of economic systems. So basically what we're talking about in economics, it's studying how people make decisions in the face of scarcity. I mean, what is scarcity first? We probably should define that. People want everything. I want everything that I can possibly have. I'd like a Porsche. I'd like a Mercedes. I'd like this, that, the other thing. I would like to have a house here and a house there. I would like to have this for dinner today and that for dinner tomorrow, no matter what the cost or availability is. But we just can't have it all. Things are limited. Um, the resources are limited. And, and the services to provide it is limited. And the goods and, you know, the fabrication of goods is limited. So there's a scarcity. People always want more than they can have. So therefore, they have to then make trade-offs. What is a trade-off? They have to trade off what they really want. And then somehow will trade off things they don't want for it. Uh, for example, if you talk about a college education. I'll talk about my cousin. My cousin always wanted a Corvette. He was not the greatest student in the world, and upon graduating from high school, he went right and worked in an automotive factory in Detroit and made way more money than I was making. And he worked for General Motors, so he was able to buy a Corvette for, uh, you know, bought it at the employee discount, and it was great for him. Uh, and in fact, I enjoyed riding around in his car and thought I wanted a car like that, and I did, but never had one. Myself, I traded off the desire to have that car. My priority was to go to college so that I put my money and my efforts into getting a college education. And eventually, I think I'd probably make more money than him now, but... Uh, Early on, he did. So we made trade-offs about that. So economics is a study of how people make decisions in the face of scarcity. And it's, the you know, we're looking in micro more about these individual decisions, family decisions, and business decisions. And then uh, when we're looking at macroeconomics, we're looking more about business and societal type, governmental type decisions. There's a wonderful website um, for the Federal Reserve, um, and they call it the FRED, and it, it, there's data on 400,000 domestic and international economic and social variables over time. And you should go at least nose around there. It's a resource for this course and other courses you may take to back up some of the ideas and opinions you are trying to present in either presentations or papers. So. Also, you need information to make economic decisions. And information today travels faster than it ever has. So the point of this slide is, in the social media age, I can go back to this Fred site and have information at my fingertips. If I'm doing something at 2 o'clock in the morning and need a, need a bit of information, it's available on the Internet, whereas perhaps in previous times, when I was your age and a student, I would have to wait till the next day when the library was open and not even go access the internet in the library because it didn't exist, but go access the publications that were put out and stored in the library. And it was a general resource everybody could use, but it was only at certain times you could use it. So the more information you have, the better and faster decisions you can make. 
Um, the point here is they're trying to tell you that, you know, homeless people are a stark reminder that scarcity of resources is real. But you know that yourself. Uh, a lot of our students are working, maybe commuting, maybe playing sports. For those of you that play sports, 30% of North Park students play sports. They might have gone to a different school if, if sports wasn't important. But North Park was a place where they could continue their baseball or football or basketball or softball or whatever career you were looking at. And it was a good choice for you to come and play sports and get an education at the same time. Other people maybe not caring about sports or and maybe equal athletes to some of you, but couldn't play Division I, thought it was more important to go to the University of Illinois if they could get in or Northwestern than to go to a D3 school and play sports. So we're making these trade-offs all the time. Uh, certainly homelessness, I don't think they, uh, sometimes I don't know that they've actually made choices uh, like I want to make a choice to sleep on this park bench as opposed to uh, working hard and uh, getting a college education and getting a good job on Wall Street and blah, blah, blah. I Sometimes beyond just the, the scarcity, it could be scarcity of willpower, scarcity of intellectual um, ability to to do well and excel in school. Some people are better salespeople than other people. So it's, it's those kinds of choices. But when we talk about scarcity, it's usually scarcity of resources. Economics kind of got its start, really kind of got codified into its own thing with Adam Smith. He wrote a book in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations. And he introduced the idea of dividing labor into discrete tasks. Uh, so we, everybody could focus on one thing, learn to do it very well, and together create something more fantastic. When we look in a modern factory, you have a division of labor. Uh, the assembly line is a division of labor. Some people put the wheels on and tighten the lug nuts. Other people are putting car seats in or dropping the engine into the car frame, for example. A lot of factories now are training people to do cross jobs. But if we think about it in um, the history of mankind, scarcity comes from, excuse me, not scarcity, but the division of labor comes early on. Imagine we're in some primitive Cro-Magnon or later, and believe me, anthropology is not my strength here, society where we're were hunters or gatherers or hunter-gatherers. Well, some people were better at hunting than gathering. So early on, people decided, listen, why don't you be the hunter? And I'm really good at gathering, gathering nuts and fruits and this. I'll do that. You do this. And we'll have the best of meats and fishes and from the hunters and the best of fruits, vegetables, nuts, berries, whatever, from the gatherers. Well, and if everybody had to fend for themselves to prepare the food, there might be a third class of person that was actually better at making the food. Well, you guys go hunt, you guys go gather, and bring it back to me, and I'll prepare the food because I can prepare it better than all of you. So all of a sudden, people had specialties and skills in areas where they divided the labor. As for a hunter, you could be a great hunter, but not a great maker of spears. I could be a great maker of spears. I knew the right wood to get. I knew how to find the right stone and the right hemp or whatever they use to tie the stone to the stick to make a spear out of it. And of course, shape, shape the flint that was the spearhead using harder rocks and whatever to design that, and I was really good at it. So I'll tell you what, I'll divide, I'll make the spears, you go hunt. That person over there is going to do the food preparation, and that person over there is going to be the gatherer, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes on and on from there. Eventually, you're trying to figure out, well, how do we exchange this? Uh, I go out, I'm a hunter, and I go out and kill some sort of animal, a, a deer. 
Well, how many spears is that worth? One, two, half? I don't know. How many food preparations is that? Well, probably more food preparations than for a spear. A spear takes, you know, let's say it takes three days to make one. But then you use the spear and you go out and hunt the deer shortly. So the amount of time and effort put into both are not equal. Yet the deer will provide several meals and not to mention the hide, which if, if you have the person in, the, in your little clan, your little tribe, your little village, that's really good at tanning and turning that hide into leather. And then another person can actually make moccasins out of them. You see where this goes. So people start trading their skills and bartering for the goods that they're better at making with others. And then you start thinking about a medium of exchange. How much is one task worth relative to the other? That's where money comes into it. It's basically a, a measure of a unit of work output that you can then trade for. So if I have $10, I could buy $10 worth of apples or $10 worth of shoes, which wouldn't be very good. I'd probably need $50 to $150 to buy shoes especially if I want them to last for a certain amount of time. But you get the picture of how this works. So we divide and subdivide these tasks uh, of producing a good and service within a factory, for sure we do that now. And within our, our, our own labor, we have the same thing today. Some people are better at accounting and become accountants. Some people gravitate towards working with their hands and maybe become woodworkers or construction people. Other people are good at um, managing others and putting complex details into an organized sense so that you can efficiently get things done. They become managers. All of this. Maybe some people are good at handling this thing that we created uh, uh, millennia ago called money. And they're you need someone to manage it. You know people that don't manage money well, people that manage money well. It'd be good to have someone in your company, let's call him the treasurer or the chief financial officer or whatever, that's probably good at handling money. So specialization. Workers or firms take on particular tasks that they're well suited for within the overall production process or the overall societal process. Um, business then can take advantage of what they call economy of scale, which means basically that um, as the production levels have increased, the average cost of producing a unit declines. That's a little bit involved with variable and fixed costs. And I'll give a little prelude to that right now. If you have a factory that makes LED light bulbs, and it's uh, cost you uh, $100 million to make it, and you only make one light bulb. And the light bulb costs you, I don't know, $2 in materials to make it and labor. Well, if you only make one light bulb in a factory that costs you $100 million, you have to sell that light bulb for $100 million and $2 to break even. But a factory, you don't make a factory invest a hundred million dollars in a factory to make one light bulb, you invest a hundred million dollars into a factory to make a hundred million light bulbs. Now the fixed cost is only a dollar and the economy of scale is I can sell each each light bulb for three dollars and break even. Now, I've grossly simplified it but you get the picture. Now, the difference between, you, you've already taken macroeconomics and probably taken it from uh, Professor Sundholm. Macroeconomics is a, a branch of economics that focuses on the broad issues. Uh, we're talking about growth, unemployment, inflation, trade. It's the economies and financial doings and production of countries and the trade between countries. So it's macro. Macro means big, so we're thinking big. We're thinking um, the economic output, the economic engines of countries and how they interact with each other. And some global corporations probably are worth more than some small countries these days. So 
I would think it dips down into that level of really, you know, like maybe the Fortune 500 companies or the 500 largest com corporations in the world might fit into that macro economic study. Micro, on the other hand, fo focuses more on actions of individual. They call them agents, but within the economy, but individual people or family. So when we talk about agents within an economy, it's households, workers, and businesses. And as the businesses get larger, it becomes, of course, more macro. So we're looking at how people make those decisions. Another word for uh, a way people have titled microeconomics courses and books is called price theory. Because we're focusing on the micro. A company makes a product. How much can they sell it for? How many people will buy it at this price versus twice that price versus half that price? We're going to start looking at those kinds of things. And so price theory is something that business people are looking at all the time and trying to get a handle on. Remember, profit is price times quantity sold. That would be your, your revenue, not profit, excuse me. So revenue is price times quantity sold. So you want to maximize your revenue. And there's a relationship between the price that you charge for an, an item and the quantity you'll be able to sell at that price. You know, if you take a simple product like a, a throwaway Bic or Waterman pen, you're not going to be able to sell that pen for uh, $12. You've got to sell that pen for $2 for a box of 10 or 20 cents a piece or 25 cents a piece or something like that. And then you're going to sell a lot of pens. So the, pr the quantity you sell at the price determines the revenue. And it's that multiplicative factor that determines your revenue. So doubling the price doesn't mean you double your revenue because the quantity may go down by four times if you double your price. And therefore, you would sell less at that price. And that's what we want to study here. So in the larger frame, economics is looking at the well-being of all people, including those with jobs, those without jobs, as well as those high incomes, low incomes, and how they make choices. And what are the right choices at the societal level? What's the right choice at a level of a firm, which is a business? What's the right choices at the household level and at um, the individual level? With the, the COVID-19 pandemic that we've all experienced, those choices have changed probably faster than they would have in a normal economic time. So other terms that we want to look at. And these are a review from uh, macroeconomics. We're talking about monetary policy and fiscal policy. <clears throat> well, monetary policy is, it involves a level of interest rates. You, you, people need money to invest in their businesses and grow their businesses and make decisions about their businesses, expand their businesses. Sometimes people contract their businesses. But for all the expansion and growth, people need money to fund that. So they, if they don't have the money, they go borrow it if they can. And so what is the interest rates? How is that money released and how much money is available in a society from the central bank of a government and at what interest rates? So obviously, the lower the interest rates, the more economic activity you're going to generate. The higher the interest rates, the, you're going to slow the economy down. Why would you want to slow the economy down? Maybe to mitigate inflation. If infl you know, prices are starting to get carried away, the Federal Reserve will, of course, um, raise their prime interest rate, their lending rate, and therefore money will become tighter and commerce slows down a little bit and prices then have to follow that. So closely associated with a monetary policy is a fiscal policy. So these are the policies that involve government spending and taxes. How much money should we spend? How much should we raise in taxes? And uh, in an election year like this is, I'm recording this in, um, in July of 2020, we're going to see uh, a lot of that being debated and what's good 
Uh, we're the party that's not going to raise taxes. We're the party that's going to raise taxes and solve all the ills of society. We're the party that believes in small government. We're the policy, uh, the po political party that believes in large, uh, active government out there solving and, and fulfilling the needs of people. And there's sometimes there's no real resolution to some of these debates. One of the prime economists, other than Adam Smith, is John Maynard Keynes. And uh, it says right here, he's an influential economist in modern times. He advocates that economics teaches one how to think, not what to think. And it's good to look at that. I think, and this is a segue, well, how do you think? What model do you use? What preconception do you have as you're looking at a situation and trying to make a, a decision from an economic point of view? So there are lots of theories. When we talked about the fiscal policies of spending and taxes, more taxes, more spending, less taxes, less spending by the, by the governments are two models of which you could look at how to run a national economy. Is one more right than the other? I think it depends on the time and economic conditions. Certainly the economic policy we had before the COVID-19, we had a certain economic policy and fiscal policy and monetary policy. Post COVID-19, it changed dramatically. So, you have a theory. How do we think the economy works? Well, it's not, it's science certainly, and there's mathematics involved, and there's certain rules that seem to happen. But most of the time when we think how does an economy work, is that we believe there's a model that we buy into, and that model is used to predict how things will happen if we make certain decisions. There's an economic term called unintended consequences. If you pass a law that says this, that, and the other thing, and you've passed that law to kind of control part of the economy or the way people behave, If you haven't really thought it out well, and if your model is not a strong and broad model, people will find their ways to short circuit such things and foil the good intentions that you had. So a theory is, or a model, both they could kind of go together as a simplified representation of how two or more variables interact with each other. So a good theory is simple enough to understand but complex enough to be able to capture the key features. We can't capture every feature in an economic situation, but if it, if it gives us a good broad direction of how things work. Some models are just con conceptual, and some models are very mathematical. So, as this last bullet point says, Economists use models to test theories. And it's almost like the, if you remember in fifth grade, the scientific principle. How do we think the economy works? How do we think people behave uh, in certain economic conditions? Well, and here's a model that we think that will represent that. If we have a model that represents, we test that model to see if it works. If it works, then we can use that model to predict how people will behave if we raise the interest rate or lower the interest rate or raise the price of this product, or lower the price of that product, or make it easier to do trade between two countries, or harder to do trade between two countries. I mean, one of the things that we talked about uh, that we've witnessed in the past couple of years is the U.S. Uh, taking a strong stand on trade with China because there's a, uh, a trade deficit with them. Well, mostly China is buying agricultural products from us. And so when we put... Um, uh, barriers up for products that, that they were exporting to us, that we were importing from China, they basically stopped buying soybeans and went to Brazil and bought soybeans instead. 
<coughs> hurting the farmers in this country. They didn't immediately kowtow or, you know, um, acquiesce to our, our demands. They went and found another solution. Was that an unintended consequence? Probably some models showed that that could happen. Other models showed that it didn't. And maybe the people that were making the decisions chose to follow one model rather than the other. So we use models to test theories. In this course, we will use terms, the terms model and theory kind of interchangeably. Because with each theory we present, there's some mathematical stuff that goes with it or a model that goes with it. In this first week, we're also going to talk about um, very simple linear cost, revenue, and profit equations and basically making some decisions on how much we should produce and at a given price to break even, to make a profit, and it's a model for kind of a back of the envelope model, which we'll talk about more, but it's not comprehensive enough to, to determine a price. We assume the price is given in that model. And models work that way. There are certain assumptions that make the model applicable. Here's a model. The circular flow diagram has been around for a couple hundred years. And it basically says, you have firms, and this is the model, uh, basically the model of microeconomics. You have firms, companies, enterprises, organizations that make good or services. And then you have households, which are individuals and families, or people that live underneath one roof with whatever quote-unquote family, their, their arrangement they have. The households provide labor to the companies. The companies pay those individuals wages, salaries, and benefits for the labor that they provide to the firm. While working, and the firms do something with that labor. They make goods and services. What do they do with the goods and services? Well, of course, they sell it to other firms, if we're talking about machine tools. But for the most part, they make goods and services that eventually benefit the households and the individuals living in the households. And how do the households, those individuals, attain those items bought, produced by the firm, the goods and services? Well, they pay for those goods and services. They pay it, the price being asked for those goods and services with the wages, salaries, and benefits that they're paid. So you have this circular flow here. Households provide labor, labor the firm to produce goods and services. The firms also provide wages and salaries. The households use that, those wages and salaries to pay for all the goods and services they are going to use. And that's why, here's a very clear example of scarcity. You can only buy so much stuff with the money that you've earned either as an entrepreneur, if, if you happen to own a firm, or if you happen to work for the firm. Some people make millions and millions of dollars. Some people only make thousands of dollars. And that limits, of course, what they can buy. So it shows how households and firms interact with goods and service market in a labor. The direction of the arrows shows that the goods and services households receive and uh, Goods and service market, households receive the goods and, and pay the firms for them. In the labor market, which is the inner circle, and that the first one was the outer circle, uh, is the labor market. Households provide labor and receive payments from firms through wages, salaries, and benefits. Now, there's a way to organize economies. Um, there's at least three ways, and I think we've, we've categorized them into three three large buckets, if you will. There's a traditional economy. It's based on closer to that early man model that I talked about a few slides ago. But basically, it's an agricultural economy where things are done the same as they've 
always were done historically. It's the oldest economic system. It's a system of barter. It's used in parts of Asia, Africa, and South America till, still to this day, even though it's probably less prevalent than it used to be. Occupations tend to stay in the family. If you look at some people's last names in various different cultures, they're named Miller because they were expert at, at, at grinding grains down to flowers. And, uh, or other people's were, you know, people had the last name Shoemaker. Guess what they did? Uh, other people had the last name, you know, in, in the Armenian culture that I come from, there's people called Palanjan. Palanji is a saddle maker. Uh, Demirjan. Uh, Demir is iron. So Demirji is the iron maker. And um, you have these kinds of last names where the occupations kind of, your last name kind of came from the occupation that your family was in. Sometimes what you produce is what you consume, but also there's a barter system if people were good at doing something more so than someone else was. And so if I was the iron maker or the shoemaker, I need food, but what could I trade? The iron implements that I made or the shoes that I would make, I would trade them for people that were better at growing food, gathering food, or hunting for food. And so it's, if you're talking about economic devel development and progress here, it's probably on a slower rate. The command economy It's basically a dictatorship. We're an economy where all economic decisions are passed down from the government authority and where the government owns the resources. Uh, think of really dictatorial kingdoms. Um, and of course, uh, I think people would call the, the system in Cuba being a command economy and the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union as being a command economy. The government decides what goods and services will be produced and the price that it will charge for them. The government decides what methods of production to use and sets wages for work. The government provides many necessities like health care and education for quote unquote free. So it's a command economy. Uh, where would you say China is today? I think they've got one leg here and another leg. Well, here's the examples of command economy and we'll get into that. Um, ancient Egypt, I mean, they, they have got the pyramids here, which is a gorgeous picture. Uh, the, the picture that came with the slides didn't come through for some reason, so I went on the internet and copied an even better picture. Medieval manor life, where the king was responsible for everything, and the peasants that lived around the, uh, the castle of the... Uh, lord or king of uh, the small geographic area, they were all serfs and worked for the king. Communism certainly, and if we're talking about in the current world today, can't command economies uh, in Cuba, it's in North Korea. China used to be more, I would, you know, 30 years ago, we would probably put China in there with Cuba and North Korea, and certainly the former Soviet Union, but more so, when I should have put another picture here, uh, you have a market economy, which is kind of more like we have right now, where decisions are kind of decentralized, private individuals own resources, where in a command economy they didn't, and businesses supplies goods and services based on demand. There's a, it's a, when we say market economy, there's an interaction between potential buyers and sellers, a combination of demand and supply, and the prices fluctuate based on that. Uh, private enterprise is a system where private people then can pool together their resources, or if it's only one person, take their entrepreneurial talents and create an entity, create a firm that provides goods and services on a broader scale and can create more wealth. Uh, and I guess the picture that should have been here is a picture of the New York Stock Exchange because nothing says market more than the New York Stock Exchange where um, securities are 
are, are bartered and traded and bought and sold every day. So real world economies. Most economies in a real world are probably mixed. They combine elements of all. The U.S. is probably closer to being a market-oriented end of the spectrum. Many countries in Europe and, and Latin America, well, they're, they're market-oriented, but have a greater degree of government involvement in the decisions, and they might provide the health care in a socialized medicine kind of scenario. They talk about China and Russia have moved in the direction of market oriented system. And I think China's done a much better job than Russia. But if you look at what's happening in China with Hong Kong and sometimes how they um, govern within the, the, the borders of their country, it's, uh, it's still a little bit more command oriented than we think is right in this country. And I'm not sure which is right because I think you know, to a certain degree, you could argue that China is economically beating the pants off the U.S. right now. And Europe is what Europe is. Latin America is probably, I don't know if it's a command market, but I think it's closer, probably got market. Macro is market, and maybe on a micro level, it's more command. And maybe that's where China is today, too. And I'm not sure what Russia is. So, regulations. What are the rules of the games? Well, is there such thing as a free market? Okay, there's a free market. I could sell you the Sears Tower. And, I, you know, I need the money. And for $1,000, I'll sell you the, the, the Willis Tower downtown. Because people were being scammed in New York at the turn of the last century by people selling the Brooklyn Bridge with some fake paperwork and all this. Do we want those kind of scam transactions to happen? Do we want to fool people? No, we make rules against it. Sometimes people have to be legislated to protect themselves. Just because you're a great salesman doesn't mean you should be able to take advantage of gullible people. So we have rules. The game should be played kind of fairly. And depends on what side of the spectrum you are about how pristine and, and above board the world is or how much, how many, cons, you know, how far you're on the other side where everything is a, a giant conspiracy and no matter what you do, you're never going to get ahead because you're not the big decision makers in this. So spending too much time on that. Uh, economies that are primarily market oriented have fewer regulations. In an election year, people are always, you know, you would say the Republicans are less government intervention, allow more free enterprise. Uh, the Democrats may be a little bit on the other side of that where they're saying, no, we can't let corporations run the country. Uh, we have to have some regulations to make sure that people have basic needs met. Where, where do you stand on that? There are two theories. There's models that follow it. And there's unintended consequences if you do one to the extreme or the other to the extreme. So here they're saying heavily regulated economies often have an underground economy. I mean, if you look in uh, Venezuela, for example, it's a disaster of an economy and it's a command economy. But because there's so many rules and it's such a disaster and there's no goods and services available, there's a huge underground market there where trade is done in dollars, which is banned in the country. And yet an unintended consequence of real strict guidance, thinking that you're doing it for the betterment of the country and the people. Maybe you're only doing it for the betterment of the pocketbooks of the leaders is the unintended consequence is that you, you end up with a black market. So that's where buyers and sellers make transactions without the government's approval. And that happens. 
the other thing that's increasingly under focus now with uh, the spread of the, the COVID virus is globalization. Well, the United States experienced, you know, we were the premier economic powerhouse in the 50s and 60s. As time progressed, 70s, 80s, 90s, now in the 2000s, a lot of industry, not all, have moved out of the U.S. where labor is cheaper. Or the regulations in the government are more lax and or geared towards production of whatever whatever uh, products move their production uh, off our shores. So what we used to make and export to other countries are made by this, maybe the same corporations, but imported now into this country. So some countries are good at making certain things or growing certain kinds of crops or raising certain kinds of, uh, of animals for, for food. Other com countries may not be well suited for that, so there's trade. I would trade if I if the U U.S. Is really grows a lot of corn, soybeans, and wheat, and we can export that. We're really not good at sugarcane, but Brazil and many countries in South America are better suited for sugarcane and coffee and not as good as these other things. So from an agricultural standpoint, we would, as countries, barter for those. On a, on a macro scale. Of course, it's done by companies inside, but you, the government sets up the ability for that international trade, that exporting and importing. The same applies to industrial goods. And whoever can do it cheaper can probably produce more of it and create demand in other countries for their exports, which would be imports from those countries. And as you recall from macro, gross domestic product measures the size of the total production of an economy. So when we talk about the global economy, the container ship is a wonderful example of this international trade. If you look at old movies and films, you know, they're probably in black and white, uh, maybe in the 30s, uh, and if they showed you lo lo loading ships. They were loading, loading individual cartons and in container, or, you know, crates, and they would put it in a net and lift it up with a, with a crane and move it over into the ship and lower it into the hold of the ship where workers down there would put it away and uh, store all this stuff, and it took forever to load a ship and forever to unload a ship. Uh, come World War II, uh, some Army logistics officers had the idea to move goods and services quicker for the World War II war effort by putting them basically in railroad cars without wheels and call them containers. So you would load these at... Um, Wherever it was, you produced the goods that were going into those containers. The containers would then be put on some wheels, basically a framework that it fit into with wheels on it, attached to a truck, or put on a flatbed of a train, maybe stack two of them high, and move them from wherever production was to the port. Then cranes, bigger cranes, more industrial cranes, would pick up the container, each container, and put it on the ship into the array that you see, all here. The entire ship is only geared for this base to float and propel the ship, but everything else was for loading these containers on. And you can see, this is the only part where the people that run the ship would be, and they run the entire ship from here, and you could put thousands and thousands of goods on a container ship like this and load it relatively quickly compared to the way it used to be done and unload it very quickly and put it on a flatbed rail car at the destination or another one of those frames with wheels and attach it to a, a truck. And then you can move the goods much faster around the world. This allowed 
This allowed for the economies to globalization to happen. That uh, this this enabled the ability to ship lots and lots of goods, a lot more goods in high volumes by taking so that I don't have to have the factory in a country that I'm actually going to sell the products in. I can move the factory to Asia or wherever the labor is cheaper, wherever it's more economical to produce it. And if, if I'm saving enough money to, to allow for the ocean voyage of these products and still sell it for less than it was to make it in the, the, the previous country. So if I, if I can make cars cheaper in China or Japan or wherever than I can in the United States, why not produce them there? And if the transportation to get them here <clears throat> still makes it less than to produce the cars here, why don't I do that? So here's a discussion question you can think about. What are examples of products and services in the modern economy? How has this contributed to globalization? Well, think about agriculture. When I grew up, you could only buy strawberries for about three weeks during the summer. They were grown locally. In the growing season, they bloomed, they were harvested, they were distributed, and that was it. Then there was no strawberries. Whatever strawberries you bought after that were frozen from that same harvest. Well, now that we can quickly move agricultural goods around the world quickly and around the country quickly, you have strawberries being grown everywhere. Uh, you used to only be able to get watermelons in the summer. Now you can get watermelons year-round. More in the summer, but still you can get them year-round. Same thing with corn and any of those things. So there's a lot of product that, and modern convenience that we have that are the result of globalization. Now, is all globalization good? Well, no, it, it detracts from your gross domestic product. If you're a country like the United States that used to make, uh, let's say, and I'm making this up, 80% of the goods that you consumed, and now you only make 50% of the goods that you consume, well, your economy has lost something. The, the jobs that you provide people are probably less paying. And therefore, you've made your country somewhat poorer. And I'm, of course, I'm grossly oversimplifying. That's it for chapter one. I thank you for your attention. And there's only 13 more chapters to go, so it should be pretty good. Looking forward to uh, interacting with you in this class. Thank you so much.